Good evening, and welcome to The Angry Astronaut. Got a double shot of content heading your way Monday morning, getting the week started off right. And the first thing that I really wanted to talk to you guys about was Saturn V. Some of you may be surprised to hear me say that Saturn V is still the king of rockets, and I I stand behind that position, even though SLS has officially become the most powerful rocket to ever head to space, and even though Starship looks likely to eclipse both rockets' records uh, in the near future, I believe that Saturn V is going to remain the king of spaceflight for a considerable period of time because it did something that neither of these rockets are going to be able to do for a very long period of time. As a matter of fact, neither SLS nor Starship may be able to do what Saturn V did over half a century ago. Oh, and a quick update on the launch situation. Uh, you may have heard that there's a placeholder event that's been uh, put into, uh, has been announced anyway for March 11th. And uh, as much as I had hoped that I would be able to handle the expense of two trips, it turns out that if that date holds up, that's not going to be very easy to do because a lot of my ability to be able to fund two trips was dependent on being able to use uh, hotel miles or rather hotel points in order to get a significantly reduced cost on hotel rooms or free hotel rooms. And given the fact that that placeholder date is dead in the middle of spring break, well, that means I can't use those, which means I'm not only paying full price, I'm paying pretty much top dollar for those hotel rooms, at least according to the information I've been able to gather thus far. To be completely clear, this is my problem, not your problem. So if you're not in an excellent and comfortable position in to contribute to all of this, given how much you guys have contributed already, then please don't do it. This is my own problem that I need to get taken care of. However, if it is a very easy thing for you to help out with, well, the links are in the description for both PayPal and Patreon. And for those of you who are members of my Angry Advocates group on Discord, you've noticed that I've started to upload lots of unique and exclusive content for members only. So doing my best to compensate everybody that's contributed to what I've been able to accomplish over the last several months, both in Europe and in Texas. So enough of that. Let's get on with Saturn V. This is the home of one of only three remaining Saturn V rockets on display in the world at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. And I have to admit, as impressed and as overwhelmed as I was with this rocket, I was also extremely sad to see it, because this was a rocket that wasn't intended to go on display, but rather to go to the moon. But of course, it remains here because we gave up on the dream of going back to the moon and exploring the solar system, at least with human spaceflight. However, upon seeing the rocket in person, I was still filled with a sense of awe. And here's the first thing that makes Saturn V the king of rockets, in my opinion, and that is the F-1 engine. As much as we talk about the capabilities of Raptor, Raptor 2, and everything else that SpaceX is doing right now, it doesn't take away from the fact 
fact that the F1 engine generates 1.5 million pounds worth of thrust or triple the peak capability of the Raptor 2. Absolutely astonishing. At full thrust, the five F1 engines on Saturn V were capable of delivering 7.5 million pounds worth of thrust, or nearly as much as the 31 engines on Starship delivered with the static fire that took place a few days ago. Now granted, those engines were only dialed up to about 50% power, but nevertheless, when you consider that five engines could generate almost as much thrust as 31 engines, whether they be throttled to 50% or not, it's still an amazing capability. No other rocket was able to carry as much payload to orbit or indeed to the moon using this many engines, not even close. The Soviet N1 could generate a little bit more thrust with 30 engines, and of course, we all know that it didn't even manage to make it to space. And another factor that Starship fans need to consider is that even at this incredible amount of power, these five F-1 engines took nine seconds to build up enough thrust to achieve liftoff, which means the static fire that we observed a few days ago would have had to have burned almost double the amount of time in order to carry the extremely heavy Starship off the ground. And there are other things to consider as well. The ISP on Saturn V is substantially less than what Raptors are going to be able to achieve because they use RP-1 instead of methane. RP-1 generates a lot of thrust, but not a whole lot of ISP, only about two and a half minutes worth of thrust. So by the time the first stage ran out of fuel, you'd be looking at 9,700 kilometers per hour, but only 61 kilometers worth of altitude, which means Saturn V wouldn't even have broken the Kármán line by the time it ran out of fuel. So how do you make up for that? Well, by using liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen in the second stage, and a hell of a lot of it. Almost a million liters worth of liquid hydrogen and over 300 100,000 liters worth of liquid oxygen powering five J2 engines generating over 1.1 million pounds worth of thrust and most importantly a burn time of over six minutes. Liquid hydrogen doesn't generate as much thrust as kerosene does but it does have a tremendously good ISP. It's actually the most efficient rocket propellant we can possibly use. Even methane isn't quite as good as hydrogen. Also, it burns a lot cleaner, which is one of the reasons why it was chosen as the primary propellant for the space shuttle, even though the shuttle needed the extremely high amount of thrust behind the solid rocket boosters in order to get it to the necessary altitude before the rest of the engines would do the rest of the job, but still, burning that clean allowed the RS-25 engines to be reused a lot more efficiently, and so these these engines would allow Saturn V to gain an altitude of about 185 kilometers, still a long ways to the moon, which is kind of my point here. In order to reach the moon, you need lots of stages, and this will count for Starship as well, unless you're going to do a lot of refueling. That being the case, you needed a third stage on Saturn V as well. And here's one of the most amazing things about Saturn V. It's third stage. It has only one J2 engine with maybe 10% more thrust than a Merlin engine has, but its burn time is astonishing. The first burn time of about three minutes is what was necessary in order to get Saturn V into orbit, and the second burn in order to deliver the rocket, or rather the Apollo module, into translunar injection was a burn of five minutes. So while SLS, Falcon Heavy, Falcon 9, just about any rocket these days has completely run out of fuel, Saturn V had 480 seconds worth of ISP left. Now, granted, with only a little over 200,000 pounds worth of thrust, but that was sufficient to take care of 99%, actually over 99%, of the total travel distance between the Earth and the Moon. 
all the rest of those engines, all the rest of that thrust was only sufficient to get Saturn V about a thousand kilometers off the ground. The rest of everything was handled by the third stage. And this is one of the reasons why SLS needs a lot more thrust than Saturn V had at takeoff, because it needs to get the ICPS and the Orion module to a much higher altitude than the first stage of Saturn V had to get to, because it doesn't have a third stage. And of course, also, it doesn't have a lander. As we all know, SLS is incapable of landing on the moon, whereas, of course, Apollo had both a service module, a command module, and a lunar excursion module, or the LEM, which means Saturn V is the only rocket in the foreseeable future that's going to be able to take astronauts to the surface of the moon in a single launch. Is it wasteful? Yes, it cost an enormous amount of money, and absolutely none of it was reusable, which is one of the reasons why it was cancelled. But nevertheless, when you consider that after all of that thrust and all of that fuel had been used just to get the service module and the command module out to lunar orbit, it only took a single AJ-10-137 engine with a mere 20,000 pounds worth of thrust to get the astronauts all the way back to Earth. And this is the tyranny of gravity. The whole problem that we have trying to leave our planet and explore the rest of the solar system is the fact that our planet has an enormous amount of gravity compared to most rocky planets in the solar system. Therefore, it makes it extremely difficult for us to leave our planet. Indeed, if our planet were only a little bit bigger than it is now, Saturn V wouldn't have worked. We never would have been able to get to the moon. We might never have been able to leave the confines of our own planet at all. And that's something that we should be very grateful to Saturn V for. A rocket that was capable not only of getting to orbit, not only of getting all the way to the moon, but also capable of delivering two astronauts safely to the lunar surface several times, and also bringing them back safely. That's something that Starship can't do. That's something that SLS can't do. That's something that no rocket is going to be able to do for a considerable amount of time, and adding a third stage to Starship is likely the only way to duplicate this capability in the future. Oh, and speaking of third stages, I have a little bit of trivia for you. In 2002, an object was discovered orbiting Earth, and it shouldn't have been there. It was identified as J002E3, but most interestingly, it isn't a natural object, but instead, the third stage of Apollo 12. In the early days of the Apollo program, these stages were supposed to be put into a heliocentric orbit, but it appears that the third stage of Apollo 12 didn't want to go to the sun, but instead hang around home. Now, this is a very unstable high Earth orbit. It left our proximity in 1971, left again in June of 2003, and probably won't be back in our neighborhood for another 40 years but it's still there, hanging around, reminding us of the glory of the Apollo program. So that having been said, we really need to keep in mind all of the lessons taught by the Saturn V rocket and the Apollo program, and its capabilities that we still haven't been able to duplicate up to this day. Now I'm not saying we need to go back to using kerosene for propellant or to build a new version of the F1 or anything like that. Saturn V was extremely wasteful and extremely expensive, but it got the job done, and perhaps there's something we can learn from it as time goes on. Hell of a rocket, my god. Um, just an amazing thing to see. It's the second time that I've seen that rocket in person, but still... After SLS and after all the claims that Saturn V has been eclipsed in so many ways, really, I don't think it has. What Saturn V has accomplished, it's going to take a very long time for any other rocket to match or surpass what Saturn V accomplished during the time of Apollo. Truly an amazing rocket, second to none. 
Please like, please subscribe, and check the description for links to my new merch for Team Starship and Team Vulcan, part of the 100K Sub Club Challenge. If you're interested in supporting your favorite rocket as I move towards that legendary 100,000 subscribers, that milestone that's so important to us YouTubers, well, check it out. Pretty neat stuff created by a very talented team that I have working for me. And as always, guys, stay angry about space.